good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, golden words in pediatric ophthalmology a really upcoming field of course i have with me the doyen of this field uh, professor jagatram who has spent many years in under, under whom almost all of us have learned so much uh, dr pramod pandey dr pk pandey i think should be joining us shortly uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar Pandey, I have, I couldn't see, and Dr. Deepthi, if uh, she could come up on the dais. Anyway, I think we'll start with the program. So I'll request Dr. Jagatram to say a couple of words before we invite the first speaker. Uh, first of all, uh, I welcome all of you. Uh, please come uh, to this session on Golden Word Pediatric Session. So I have with me uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena, who, who does uh, all the, the, the strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology, and uh, Dr. Pramod Kumar Pandey, co-chairman of this session. And I don't know that out of the six speakers, how many have come? Dr. Shukla won't probably come. Rest are, I think, Dr. Nidhi, I don't know. Uh, rest. I mean, Dr. Nidhi. Professor Nidhi Shukla, Achha, yes. Dr. Nidhi is there, Professor Shukla, Love Dr. Shukla. Love, Professor Shukla is not here, I think. Dr. Vanita Gupta, Hello. Ah, Dr. Hello. Okay, okay, I think we, we are adequate number of people here. Uh, so we'll... Uh, We'll start this session with uh, a very important and upcoming topic, which is the overview of myopia by Dr. Damiris Magdalene. Uh, she is from Shankar Dev Netrale at Gohati, doing an excellent work there. And uh, it will be a pleasure to listen to Dr. Damiris, please. A very good evening. I will be talking to you about myopia. Is it working? As we all know, myopia is a type of refractive error of the eye in which parallel rays of from infinity will focus in front of the retina after passing through the refractive components of the eye. By classification, by appearance, you can classify it as simple, degenerative, nocturnal, pseudo, and by magnitude, whether it is low, moderate, or high. By age of onset, it could be congenital, young, or adult. By 2050, we know that the global prevalence of myopia prediction will be about 50%. But why myopia progression is a concern? Because research suggests that the odds ratio of ocular disease leading to potential blindness is increased by two times with low refractive error as low as minus two diopters. Actually, how does a person develop a refractive error? It is because of the genetically programmed ocular growth, which is the same in both eyes, which ceases by 14 to 16 years, and the visually driven ocular growth, which could be a blur or an interaction between accommodation and convergence. When there is a mismatch between this genetically programmed ocular growth and visually directed growth, person develops a refractive error. And this growth of ocular components requires a correlated growth between all these components by the axial lens, corneal power, crystalline lens power, and the anterior chamber depth. We know axial lens should increase to 24 millimeter, corneal power should reduce from 50 to 43, and the lens should flatten from 45 to 20 diopters by six years of age. This visually driven growth, it could be because of a blur, and it is said that it is a peripheral retinal image defocus, which causes an increase in axial length and hence a myopia. And also, in myopics, we see a lag of accommodation, that is, the patient accepts a more plus. And also, because of transient changes in axial length following short periods of accommodation because of mechanical tension. Other potential factors include genetic, optical-related factors, environmental factors. CREAM study, which is the largest genome-wide meta-analysis, 
based on 32 studies, have found that there are up to 24 genomic variations in myopia, and when there are two myopic parents, the risk increases to 12 percent. And again, SAVE study, SMS study revealed that near work was a risk factor for myopia. And the odds of myopia increase 2 percent for every one day after of near work, and also when the child keeps the book more than 20, less than 20 centimeter reading distance, the myopia increase. Researchers have found that it is not the sports, but the exposure to the outdoors that appears to be protective. And they found that it is the spectral composition rather than the intensity. They found that outdoors releases dopamine, which is known to inhibit the eye growth. Children with seven hours or less of sleep, they have a higher risk compared to those who slept nine hours. This is a study conducted in China. And also LED lamps for homework after school had a higher prevalence of myopia, about 11.2 percent. This was again a study conducted in China. And again, when a child consumes with refined carbohydrates, they found that it could be associated with childhood myopia. So this was again a study which was published in August 2020. So what are the options? So you do a thorough baseline investigation for near esophoria, accommodative lag, cycloplegic refraction and the axillant measurement. See, when we do a biometry, there is this axillant to corneal ratio. When it is more than three, it, there is a risk of development of myopia. It is a predictive factor. You can always inform your children, your patients, oh, you're going, there is a tendency for increase in myopia. And again, when the myopia increases, when there is, an when there is more than one diopter per year, it needs more aggressive treatment. So this brings us to the sequential management protocol, which includes your refractive error correction, maximum plus for myopia, and pharmacological like atropin drops, added lens, vision therapy, and diet modification. We have the spectacles. It could be either a single vision lenses, your PALS, your executive bifocus, and the defocus incorporated multiple segments. American Academy has given us a guideline for how to prescribe glasses in children. So normally when we prescribe the single vision lenses, it, it acts on the fovea, but actually we have to address the high peripheral hyperopic defocus, which is what is the DIMS lenses. So it has an area of 9.4 millimeter with the actual power, and then the 33 millimeter, which has islands of both plus and minus, which works on the, the, on the peripheral hyperopic defocus. Orthokeratology, which is a non-surgical topographical approach, approach, a planned corneal reshaping. When you combine ortho-K lenses with low-dose atropine, they say there is an improvement. This is what it was published in July 2020. We have a bifocals and a multifocal contact lenses which serve to correct the accommodative lag. They impose sustained myopic defocus, which is considered to be inhibitory for eye growth. And of course, our atropine drops, which people are using left and right, 0.01 percent at bedtime. And the vision therapy, basically, this is basically used to reduce convergence insufficiency, indirectly maybe helping in prevention of progression of myopia. So ultimately, whatever it is, we have to send the message to the people concerned that Pay. Children should learn to go outdoor and play. Give them standard recommendations for screen timing. Maybe our future classroom should be so that light rays enter the classrooms. General awareness to the parents, public, to the patient will definitely help go a long way in treating the myopia. So it is a co cooperative effort of parents, caregivers, teachers, social workers, public health professionals, and policy makers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, this was very nice presentation. Uh, what do we think about uh, prevention of myopia with the uh, atropine 0.01% or 0.05%? Five five. Five Which one is effective and uh, what age group ideally yeah. it works? Usually, I have start, I, we usually give 0.01% which is available in the market. We give it at bedtime for two years, then I give a gap of one year. And again, for it, if the patients are still having, then again I start it. So maybe we can start, I start by six years up to 12 years so that I have till 16 years, no? Five years we can work on the patient. If they are not improving, I've added now dim spectacles. I think I've given about 80 children with dim spectacles. Till now, maybe one patient has reported to us, maybe to the optical shop, saying that they are seeing a blur, blur glare when they look at the peri when they move the eyes. I have instructed them to keep the eyes focused straight. No, only when they move their eyes, the 
focus will fall on the defocus element. So we are yet to, the patients have not yet come back. One month review is not, one year review is not there for the DIN spectacle. Actually, the follow-up is long term. Yes. Because we don't know in the short term period what is, that, yes. uh, what is the effect of this drug. So yes. this is over a period of several years. Yes. That uh, how it progresses. I think I have submitted, uh, we have submitted some uh, patients to you, know, for yeah, the yeah. LAMP study. Yeah, yeah. We, we hope to. Uh, we have collected data from... Uh, all over the country, we have now two-year follow-up data. Hopefully, we should come up with the results in this very month. We are in process of analyzing it. We have now over 600 patients with over two years of uh, mm. follow-up. So we hopefully would come out so we'll know better how the uh, drug acts in the long term uh, in our children. So yes, it's, it's a major problem. And uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to tackle it. As has been pointed out, outdoor interventions, reducing screen time, uh, reducing the distance uh, of Change. reading and uh, tabs and phones are key interventions that are essential uh, for preventing development and for progression of myopia. So thank you, Dr. Demiris. I think uh, highlighting a very, very important, extremely essential public health important issue for us. Uh, I'll request her to... Yeah, yeah, Dr. Thank you so much. Now I will invite Dr. Nidhi, uh, Dr. Nidhi, to speak on retinopathy of prematurity and its relationship with anemia. Dr. Nidhi is consultant at NMCH Sasaram Bihar, and uh, this is associated with the Narayana Medical College and Hospital. Good afternoon. And uh, this is an extremely important topic because the number of uh, children detected with uh, retinopathy of prematurity and there are a lot of lot of issues of concern in this first is detection then is the management yes, good afternoon one and all retinopathy of prematurity is a vasoproliferative disorder of retina occurring in preterm babies having immature retina so and it is a potentially blinding condition the image represents impact of ROP and distribution across the globe. This circle is the all the babies affected by ROP. The darker color wedge represents babies severely affected by ROP. We can see that we can see that the impact is more in South Asian countries compared to high income countries and also in low to medium income countries from Latin America, North Africa, Eastern Europe. So why should we screen for ROP? First of all, the premature babies are not born with the disease. They develop disease with due course of four to five weeks. So we get a window period in which if we detect and intervene timely, the potential blinding condition is can be prevented. Who should we screen? So according to Rastiya Bal Swasti Kalyan, we have to screen all the babies with birth weight less than 2000 gram and gestational age less than 34 weeks. Babies larger and between 34 to 36 weeks has also be screened if they are with associated with risk factors. First screening has to be done at four weeks of birth. For smaller babies and born before 28 be weeks, we have to screen at an earlier time, say two to three weeks of birth. After first screening, we have to repeat screening every one to two weeks until the retina, retinal vessels mature ROP regresses or progresses to a stage where treatment is required. There are more than 28 documented risk factors for ROP in which birth weight and gestational age are the most important ones. Supplemental oxygen administration is an important modifiable risk factor. Other commonly encountered risk factors in literature are sepsis, poor birth gain, birth weight gain after birth and anemia, blood transfusion, multiple birth, and the list is long. Let us look at impact of anemia as a risk factor for ROP. This uh, graph is taken from a study from South India. It shows severe anemia, that is hemoglobin less than eight milligram per DL is associated with increased risk of ROP as compared to less severe form of anemia. A similar study was done at our center, which showed 
comparable results in relation to hemoglobin level and it also showed increased number of blood transfusion are associated with increased risk of development of retinopathy of prematurity. Coming on to pathogenesis, retinal vessels start developing at 16 week of gestation from optic disc and they move towards nasal ora serrata. They reach nasal ora serrata at 32 weeks and temporal ora serrata at 40 weeks of gestation. So what can go wrong in premature babies? When the baby is in utero, there is certain level of IGF, insulin-like growth factor and VEGF, which is required for the maturation of the retina and development of blood vessels. When the baby is born prematurely, because of hyperoxic condition, there occur down regulation of IGF and VEGF. This leads to temporary cessation of vessel growth. Uh, the retina peripheral to the vessels become hypoxic and they send signals for increased production of IGF and VEGF. When IGF and VEGF reaches a certain threshold level, neovascularization start developing. Two things can occur, either the VEGF level spontaneously decreases and there occur resolution of ROP or it progresses to become proliferative retinopathy. These new vessels are associated with fibroblast. These fibroblasts lead to scar formation. When scar tissue contracts, there occurs retinal detachment. Uh, coming to classification of ROP, ICROP2 had classified in 2005 retina into three zones, zone 1, 2 and 3. Zone 1 is a circular area with diameter double the distance between disc and macula. Zone 2 is area beyond zone 1 with diameter from disc to nasal ora serrata and zone 3 is the left out crescentic part. In ICROP3 2021, another term posterior zone 2 was introduced to mention about the more severe form of disease in zone 2 compared to more peripheral zone of zone 2. This posterior zone 2 is an area of 2 disc diameter away from the zone 1. ROP has been classified into 5 stages. Stage 1, in stage 1 we see a demarcation line between vascular and avascular retina. In stage 2, this line gains volume and becomes a ridge. In stage 3, we see extra retinal neovascularization at the level of ridge. Stage 4 and 5 are the stages of retinal detachment. Stage 4 is partial retinal detachment in which 4A is with fovea attached and 4B includes foveal detachment as well. Stage 5 is total retinal detachment. Plus disease, it's a severe form of ROP in which there occur dilatation and tortuosity of retinal vessels. Uh, now in ICROP3, it has been emphasized that this should be assessed with vessels in zone 1 rather than peripheral vessels. Another important term is aggressive ROP. Previously, it was termed as aggressive posterior ROP, which was seen in severely premature infants and it was more located in the posterior retina. But now it's seen from developing world more so. It occurs in more uh, older babies and also beyond posterior retina. So the aggressive posterior ROP term is replaced by aggressive ROP. It shows looping and shunting of vessels with severe plus disease. The hallmark of the disease is that it does not follow through the typical stages of ROP. Rather, it progresses to neovascularization stage rapidly. Notch is another important term introduced in ICROP3. It shows 1 to 2 clock hour of incursion of the disease into the more posterior zone. Early treatment of ROP in 2003 came up with guideline regarding treatment of ROP. It classified ROP into two types. In type 1, we have to treat and in type 2, we have to do follow-up. Basically, we can understand it like this. All the disease with plus, we have to treat. Only disease where without plus, we have to treat. It is it is uh, neovascularization in the zone 1. That is stage 3, zone 1, we have to treat. One example of follow-up, uh, the disease which has to be follow-up is zone 2, stage 3, without plus. Coming to treatment, so laser is the gold standard. Diode and green lasers are used with the help of indirect delivery, uh, laser delivery system. Intravitreal anti vegf agents are not yet the uh, standard treatment. Because of long-term safety concerns, there has been reports of neurodevelopmental delay and also the recurrence rate is quite high and unpredictable. 
follow up of these babies are very much required to prevent um, prevent impact of myopia cataract glaucoma retinal detachment strabismus and amblyopia to enumerate few so the take home message is uh, rop is an important cause of preventable blindness in preterm infants we should be aware of the high risk like extreme prematurity oxygen therapy so uh, proper documentation and timely referral is a must we should uh, take second opinion whenever in doubt and we should be aware of the medico legal implications thank you thank you dr nidhi uh, excellent presentation i now request dr vinita gupta who is a faculty at aims rishikesh to please come up and uh, uh, talk on the management of strabismus in children with development delay Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking about uh, management of strabismus in children with development delay. So, who do these children comprise of? They are basically these children whose progression to the predictable development phase has either stopped, slowed, or reversed. And it involves either their cognitive skills, their social skills, their emotional skills, or it could be a combination of any of these. Cause, common cause is obviously genetic abnormalities, but there may be environmental factors, such as medical conditions, or it could be a combination of these. And amongst the disorders which I have listed, it is the most common which we, which we encounter as pediatric ophthalmologists is the cases of cerebral palsy. Looking at the uh, problem, they, these children have uh, both sensory as well as motor uh, problems. So in the sensory problems, they have a decreased vision ability. And as a, uh, also, uh, the uh, cerebral, uh, cortical visual impairment is pretty common in these children. While among the motor problems, strabismus is pretty high, uh, along with the various other uh, uh, motor problems of uh, fixation instability or impairment of the saccades and pursuits. So if you look at the prevalence, uh, the prevalence in uh, cases of autism and in the case of integer disability disorders is around 13 to 14%, and mostly it is the horizontal strabismus, which is usually infantile onset. But if you look at the patients with ADHD, in these cases, there's a slightly significant increased risk of ADHD occurring in patients with strabismus, and again, here, the, as compared to the other cases where the uh, esotropia is more common, it is the exo deviations which are more common in this group. Well, in learning disabilities, there's not much of difference from a normal population, normal match controls, age match controls. Well, cerebral palsy, which is the largest group of uh, children with development delay, which we see in our practice, the prevalence is as high as 90%. Here, both esotropia and exotropia are common, and as compared to a normal uh, population uh, who are not disabled, here, the ratio of esotropia to exotropia is pretty high of 2 is to 1 as compared to 5 is to 2 for normal population. So in cerebral palsy, let's talk about uh, the deficits which are seen in cerebral palsy per se. So obviously, the prevalence of primary non-fixation is pretty high. Or, and there are anecdotal reports which say that the consecutive exotropia tends to occur spontaneously in these children, which suggests actually poor fusion. Because of this reduced or absent cheropsis, they may be having a, either intermittent or manifest strabismus. And in cases of milder forms of CP, there are Obviously, there may be cases where their children are non-strabismic, and in these cases also, again, there are some cases which have a greater chance of binocular fusion. And then I'll be making a note, especially of this type of strabismus, which is seen characteristically and pathognomic of uh, 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 ethetoid CP, which is known as a discarnative strabismus, which is seen in almost up to 30% of cases. Its prevalence tends to increase with the severity of CP, and it is basically a concomitant horizontal strabismus, which has extreme variability every time we examine the child which is unrelated to the direction of gaze or the fixation distance or any accommodative behavior or the visual attention. There is no periodicities, and this uh, is associated with a very, very poor prognosis for vision, binocular single vision, and it has a tendency for exodrift over time. So the debate which we are faced when we are dealing with children is uh, whether we should operate them or not. There are no golden rules to that. We have to assess what type of disability the child has, what is the severity of the uh, development delay he has, we should not be pushed by the pusher expectations because we have to see whether these expectations are realistic or not because family is wanting every type of performance improvement in the form of intellectual, social, mental, cosmetic, everything. Teachers are aiming, teachers of these children are aiming for intellectual uh, performance, but the rehabilitation team is working towards the physical improvement of these children. So don't use evidence-biased medicine. Don't promise breakthroughs or miracles for these children. 
Don't make them, make them emotionally charged. We have to be very, very realistic with these children. Think of the issues which are there. Why did it happen? Can we fix it? Is some fusion there? Because that will make our task easier. Because it, that will help us in deciding whether we're just doing the cosmetic surgery or actually we are giving them some binocular single vision. So factors to consider as for any other case of strabismus, what is the type of deviation? What is the binocular vision potential? What is the stability of the angle? And what is the compliance of the parents regarding the follow-up visits and the follow-up therapies? So issues which are specific to these are obviously we have very, very limited cooperation because of the communication, the comprehension skills of these children. And especially in the sensory examination part, so obviously we get the data which we get is very, very limited in terms of its quantity as well as quality. And regarding the issues of anesthesia, I've always remember that it has been uh, seen in various studies that exposure to anesthesia before the age of four years itself in normal children is also associated with uh, learning disabilities by about 50%, especially if the number of exposures is more than three, or if the time of exposure per surgery is more than two hours. However, that does, should not deter us from not operating on these children, so we have to be especially taking more care to do uh, smaller surgeries, faster surgeries in these cases, whenever we are proceeding ahead with surgeries. And another thing which is important to take care of in these children is basically, especially in countries like ours, they are in the vulnerable age group, so preschool uh, age group, where if we can give whatever benefit we can give to them, obviously will have an impact on the neural railroad delay. So obviously we should try to align them to some extent. Even if you're not able to do surgeries, we can use Botox till puberty, and then maybe when we get better assessment, we can do surgeries in the cases where it is indicated. The limitations I've already listed below uh, before that obviously difficulty in measurement, variability of measurement, unstable uh, results, and compliance issues obviously will be against uh, early surgery. So how to approach these children? Obviously you have to have a thorough involvement of the parents and the caretakers in this. Take them into in, in your con full confidence. In, uh, tell them, tell the parents that improvement in motor coordination after the surgery would be there for the child, improvement in visual perception would be there, and this will have a positive impact on his psychosocial development. But at the same time, inform the parents that there may be early as well as late misalignments or unsatisfactory alignments. So how to approach as for any other strabismus case, first, first thing first is reflective error correction, treat any underlying visual uh, disorder. So for that, it is very, very important to do MRI on every such child that you have to do the MRI once. Uh, aim for slight undercorrections in most of the cases, I'll talk about in the, the subsequent table, and use a multidisciplinary approach because we're not just targeting the ocular aspect, you're looking at the other aspects also of the child. So besides this, also inform the educators and the teachers of the children, these children who are uh, under special therapies, Give them the information regarding the visual field, the central visual field laws, the various types of visual aids which may work for them, especially the various conditions for lighting and contrast which may work for them. As regards to use of Botox in these uh, children with CP, obviously we have started using Botox in infantile isotopias, especially if the angles are very small. So how many times to be repeated in these cases? Who decides? There are not many studies or many literature available for, especially with uh, for these children with uh, development delays. But as for other cases of infantile isotropia, this can be tried in these cases as well. I don't have personal experience about that. Uh, for, but definitely no surgery when we are dealing with children with ethroid CP, diaphoretic CP, where Botox will work better, CP with small angles, where again Botox will work better, and a special group, as I told, MRI is must. So please remember there may be patients who have homonymous hemorrhagia associated with it, where exotropia is occurring to the side of hemiparesis with the face turn, and that may, is basically an active behavior. So do not operate on this child. And again, no surgery if there's a low vision, there is a poor fixation, if there's an optic atrophy, or there's a resuscitated CBI. Dosing of surgery, as I mentioned, obviously, we cannot do with the normal standard doses. We have to do under correction, especially when we're dealing with the uh, isotropic uh, cases. For exotropia, we can still go with the uh, standard doses, but not for isotropias. For isotropias, obviously, if I have to correct, um, if I'm um, dealing with an isotropy of more than 25 PDs, I would do an under correction of around 15 to 20%. And while for 20 to less than 20 PDs, if uh, isotropia is there, then we can think of giving just Botox. For exotropia, you can do a bigger surgeries. So various responses vary according to the type of syndrome we have. For Downs, as I said, don't undercorrect. But for rest of the other cases, we have to undercorrect. And uh, uh, in development delay, so in, in the end, I will just summarize that obviously there's a higher prevalence of strabismus. The type of strabismus is almost the same as, uh, as in for normal children, although the prevalence is very high. And the binocular disorder which is occurring in these children is not occurring as a sequel to strabismus, but it is, due to, uh, it is occurring as a sequel to strabismus, but not as a result of the development delay per se. So restriction of this binocular vision may be a realistic role in some cases of uh, uh, children with CP. 
and prognosis would improve if when the duration of misalignment is uh, minimized as for any other case of infantile uh, uh, isotropias. So, but especially for these children, what is more important, examining them multiple times before you take them to the operating room, do MRI imaging at least once, explain to the parents that the results are going to be less predictable and which will depend on the specific type of delay which the child has. Younger the child when we are operating, more the chances that more the number surgeries would be required. So careful consideration is what is required, especially when we are dealing with these children. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vanita Gupta, for excellent presentation. Now I will re request Dr. P. K. Pandey to comment, and any then any question from the audience also. Yes, sir. No, sir, I, that's why I lifted four or five disorders in the beginning. CP is the commonest group which we see in our practice, actually. CP. And Actually, I was targeting only for CP. CP is the people which we, uh, children which we see very commonly in our practice. Yeah, but no, every CP we don't operate. We don't operate. Yeah, yeah. And we should also look at very critical recombinating this on MRI. It's very important because some of these may also look like glaucomatous suffering. And I've seen some cases which have been diagnosed children as glaucoma. But actually what they had is they had suffering which was which is severe and just looks like glaucomatous suffering. So that we have to keep in mind. Young children don't diagnose them as glaucoma day to day. So consider these possibility also. Thank you, Dr. Vinita. Another point, of course, to be mentioned is that not just surgery, but the follow-up of these patients, very especially very uh, trying to get them rehabilitate the available <laughs> functional vision in them. So we know that many of these children, uh, which is being talked about CVI, have a lot of field effects, particularly inferior field effects. They have accommodative lag, so they are having difficulty in near vision. So all these uh, multifaceted interventions, including refractions and uh, assessing the available field, we, sh we need to uh, look at and manage. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinita, for uh, highlighting this very, very important component uh, that is now increasingly becoming uh, something as pediatric ophthalmologists we must see. I'll uh, invite uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Jagat Ram, who really does not need any uh, introduction. He will be uh, giving his talk on what he has taught us all this while generating a state-of-the-art pediatric cataract surgery. So all of us know uh, have learned pediatric cataract surgery, the state of the art from wonderful presentations he's been uh, giving. So Dr. Jagat Ram, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Saxena. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Pandey, Dr. Shekhar, and friends. I will be speaking on uh, state of art pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, while actually I was not knowing the time, I made this presentation for 15 minutes. But then I reduced it uh, to at least eight, nine minutes uh, by knowing the time that it is only seven minute time. It was 15 minutes, some uh, presentation. Anyway, I will try to finish in time. No, I, I think I, I, I will not ask time because till the next speaker, he is on the way from the airport when he comes. But before that, I will stop, no issue. Uh, my. Uh, uh, my experience uh, in this field uh, is uh, almost uh, uh, 42 year and four month at PGI and now one, one year addition. Uh, so I have worked in the field for uh, more than 40 years. Uh, from a very small beginning, year after year, I have dil diligently worked to serve the thousands of the children who were brought with millions of hope at our doorstep and to educate hundreds of the young mind who want to become leader in ophthalmology. 
of course uh, in the lower photography is professor amod gupta who is my teacher and i have i have documented more than uh, more than 12000 children and i have operated so many children in pediatric over a period of 40 years i have almost thousands of video but i have uh, made video of only very few of the few hundreds of the patients and these children they come with the visually significant cataract most of the time bilateral cataract and sometime you may see 10 to 15% of unilateral cataract and the, particularly these unilateral cataract they have uh, at the same time amblyopia also associated every child which we operate we have to dilate and uh, to see the morphology of the cataract because it is extremely important you may find php phpv as uh, in the last picture here below you may find uh, even rubella syndrome that child in the center and so many other thing you find after dilatation uh, there are so many issues of concern dilated slit temp examination is must then whether to implant iol or not uh, we have to calculate iol power if uh, we have to implant iol then increase in the axial length is another uh, problem because these are the growing eyes then uh, use sometime there may be inflammation and then management of amblyopia and long term visual uh, visual rehabilitation aim is uh, clear visual axis not short term long term clear visual axis and visual rehabilitation so here i will be showing the video uh, these were uh, some of the videos uh, on uh, pediatric cataract surgery fail to prepare then you uh, because it is extremely important that you have to diagnose pediatric cataract then plan you have to innovate execute and extremely important is follow up of these children we have very very long term follow up we have uh, i have a follow up of 30 to 35 year of these children uh first i will be showing the basic step of pediatric cataract surgery uh, this is one of the child with zonular cataract this is just to demonstrate that how we stain the anterior capsule uh, with tripen blue dye and then make the side port incision and then make uh, continuous curvilinear capsular axis and uh, th this is followed by hydro dissection and removal of the cortex from the from the capsular bag and then uh, after uh, removal of the cortex we make uh, primary posterior capsular axis and the size of the posterior axis is kept around uh, 3.5 mm or so it if it is very big uh, it may be difficult to implant uh, uh, iol which is 6 mm optics and then uh, uh, vitrectomy is done uh, limited vitrectomy in the zone of uh, posterior axis then th this is the implantation of the iol in the in the capsular bag and then whatever uh, residual tag of vitreous attraction that is removed then uh, i will be showing a few of the complicated cases which may be phpv uh, or it may be microphthalmos or juvenile idiopathic arthritis or maybe double crystal illness uh, this is uh, another child uh, with uh, uh posterior lenticonus uh, this is a classical uh, posterior lenticonus uh this is anterior segment oct it is documented with uh, this and then 
Uh, here we perform continuous curvilinear capsular axis. Limited hydro dissection because uh, we expect that there may be posterior uh, uh, capsular rent and very gently cortex is removed and uh, as expected uh, there was a posterior uh, capsular rent. This was a same shape of the rent and then uh, IOL is implanted in the capsular bag. Uh, then, then I think uh, hardly there is any uh, much vitreous disturbance and this is, uh, uh, but any of these children we have to place sutures, uh, particularly in the main section, even sometime on the side port uh, section. This is post-operatively documented uh, anterior segment OCT. Now this is another child. Uh, this is uh, a uh, posterior sanity all around here and uh, this is a JIA case. Uh, here we have used uh, malusian ring for adequate uh, pupillary dil dilatation. It is important that how we should place this malusian ring. Uh, this gives adequate uh, dilatation of the pupil and uh, continuous curvilinear capsular axis and removal of the cortex. This video is more, more than 10 years back, uh, this was uh, done. Uh, so th that time uh, more commonly we used to do three piece IOL. Uh, although these were square as IOL, it does not matter whether three piece or single piece is implanted. Uh, this is another case uh, where uh, lenticular coloboma a uh, four-year-old child and uh, here uh, issue is uh, not only implantation of IOL, it is uh, also stabilization of the capsular bag. Uh, there, there were posterior sanity and here we have uh, uh, done a continuous curvilinear capsular axis and then uh, hooks were applied. These are conjunctival, uh, these, were, these were capsular hooks. There were otherwise iris hooks, they may be more sharp edges may be there. So it is better to place uh, uh, capsular hooks. Then this is for stabilization of the capsular bag. Here, here we are placing toricaiol and uh, we, we have used uh, calisto here and uh, then uh, these uh, hooks were removed and we have to achieve the perfect centration of the IL. And then uh, this is uh, to show before and after uh, surgery. And then uh, we have this uh, double crystalline lens. This is uh, for few minutes. Uh, this is, I think uh, many of you have seen this. Here we did uh, two continuous curvilinear capsular axis on each of the, each of the lens. Two, because there are two lenses inside the eye and we also designed a customized IOL for this case. This was a very big uh, IOL because I was also big. Uh, so each of the haptic and part of the optic was placed into the capsular bag. Central part was uh, uh, just a phacic, but uh, it was covered by IOL. Uh, this is amblyopia therapy, child could achieve uh, excellent outcome uh, after occlusion therapy. Now I have seen this child after uh, uh, 10 year or so, 10 year uh, completed, and uh, it went on the myopic side. Initially it was uh, almost plus two after hypermetropic. And now this is uh, one of the clip where there is a uh, 
hemorrhagic type of PHPV. Here rexis has been done and we are doing cauterization of the posterior vascularized membrane. And then, then it is very difficult to cut with the vitrectomy cutter. So you have to make a small nick in the, this vascularized membrane and cut with the uh, vena seizure. And then cauterize this stalk. This is the stalk uh, you have to cauterize and then cut with the micro vena seizure and then remove this uh, uh, vascularized membrane. After doing a proper vitrectomy, because sometimes it may be, uh, we may not uh, uh, have, there should be no traction uh, and uh, here we are uh, placing IOL, which is captured into capsular bag. Uh, th these are some of the other other uh, these uh, cases of. Uh, uh, PHPV, classical PHPV, this is some very dense uh, uh, vascularized membrane. And uh, uh, these are some of the other toric and multifocal IOL implantation in children. And these are PHPV I am showing. Contribution is uh, more than 12,000 children operated. 134 publication in pediatric uh, cataract surgery. Invited lecture almost 172 out of 510. Mentoring 154 resident and ophthalmologist. Uh, this is a child which was operated by me in 1997. Uh, and now after follow up of 25 years now in 2022, he has become doctor. 20 by 20 vision each eye. Of course he is myopic by uh, uh, just 1.25 or some other IE is 1.5 diopter. Uh, but reasonable that time, it is a estimated power implanted that point of time. Uh, audio, uh, there, there is only one minute I can take, just last one minute. Please, please continue, sir. Audio. Audio lead is not there. इस पे तो होता नहीं है इधर है अब नहीं लगेगा इसमें नहीं लगेगा शायद ऐसे ही आएगा यही होता ना कोई बात I think no no issue और दिस दिस वाज जस्ट विदाउट ऑडियो I think this was the, just like uh, one of the proudest moments when I got Padma Shri Award in 2019. Uh, this was 30 second video and uh, just to share uh, this was uh, I think two time uh, best of the best award at the American Society of Cataract and Structive Surgery. And, uh, uh, and uh, third time, it was a just uh, winner award. And uh, one time it was Oscar of Pediatric Ophthalmology. So these were some of the, this was just to show it. Uh, this was the uh, first time when I got some award at the international form in 2012. Uh, this was also a proudest moment for me to become director of PGI ME at Chandigarh uh, without uh, any politics or so. Uh, I gave headship to Professor Dogra, who was uh, in a senior than me, but otherwise he was junior. By uh, but but anyway he was senior than me, so uh, these were the other proudest moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, very glad to see such wonderful work. Uh, you've been mentoring so many people uh, and here everybody of us here have learned so much from you. Thank you very much, sir, for Thank your you years of dedicated service to uh, ophthalmology and to pediatric eye care, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Please continue to do this good work.
I'll just invite the last speaker, Dr. Lav Kochagave, uh, who unfortunately got delayed because of the delay in his flight. He'll be talking about carrying on from where Dr. Jagatram had left on pediatric yes. cataract. He'll be talking on pediatric traumatic cataract, different scenarios. Uh, Dr. Lav Kochagave also from Calcutta has been uh, doing some wonderful work in pediatric cataract and pediatric ophthalmology. And it's definitely a pleasure to listen to Dr. Lav Kochagave. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. And because it was Patna, I, la I touched down at 4, 5 and was here by 4.30. <laughs> so uh, I, my, the topic on which I would be speaking is uh, traumatic cataract. And just a brief one slide, and after that we'll go to the videos. The different scenarios what we get in children, especially most of the traumatic cataract what we get is children and can be either a blunt or penetrating trauma. Timing of surgery is very important because most of the open globes, they, the incidence occurs in semi-urban or rural areas and by the time they reach the tertiary eye care facility or where general anesthesia facility is available, it may be a bit late, so it has to be operated as soon as they report. And after taking a fitness for general anesthesia. So we'll go through some of uh, the scenarios, uh, what we face, and this was a, a penetrating trauma which presented late. So the primary corneal wound was almost self-sealed. So we decided to go ahead with only cataract surgery. And uh, as you can see, there was an opening in the anterior capsule, pre-existing opening. So uh, capsular access was delayed after, uh, and was done after the cortical aspiration. And that was done using a cutter because with a high speed cutter, you get a very smooth margin. So this is a good substitute to manual capsular access in difficult cases. And a decent size opening is important because we want to place uh, the IOL in the bag. And a three piece IOL here in this case has been placed in the bag. And Wherever possible, and in young children, especially if they are less than seven years of age, it is very important to uh, do a posterior capsular axis also. And with the manipulation, the uh, corneal wound opened up, so a single suture was applied to the corneal wound. Main port is always sutured in young children, and a posterior capsular axis, again using a cutter. So this is how this case ended. Next comes a blunt trauma which led to a cataract and a fibrosed anterior capsule. And once you have a fibrosed anterior capsule, the most important step becomes the anterior capsular axis because again, in children, we want the lens to be placed in the back. So we have to have a decent size round opening. So when first manual capsular axis was attempted and as soon as you hit the fibrosed area, after which man proceeding manually is difficult, which was tried using a um, forceps also. But as you can see, it, wa it was not possible after this, so a cutter was used to make a smooth opening in the fibrosed area of the capsule. Slowly, and the trick is for thick, uh, thick membranes, the trick is a slightly lower cut rate and a higher vacuum. If, if the cut rate is very high, then cutting membranes becomes difficult with the cutter. Hmm. And it, we kept on trimming till we got a decent size uh, anterior capsular, uh, capsular opening. After which cortical aspiration is done. And now you have a clear view of the size of the anterior axis, which is almost five or 5.5 millimeter, and the lens has been placed in the bag. And then you go behind and uh, do a posterior capsular axis as usual. For, for many years now, I've, I've given up manual posterior capsular axis and I've been doing it only with a cutter. 
and gives a, a very good result. Another, another scenario what you can get is a intraocular foreign body along with cataract. So here, once we started cortical aspiration, uh, we, what we saw was a foreign body. And it is very important to remove it to prevent uh, future inflammation and infection in the eye. So that was uh, removed. And this is slightly different from what we had done earlier. Um, a, a utrata forceps, uh, the uh, vana scissor was used to cut the anterior capsule and the rest of the capsule excess was completed manually. And the end of it, uh, you have a bag, though, though one side the capsule excess is deficient, but still we are able to place the lens in the bag. And the problem, long-term problem that can happen in this case was that one side, if the bag starts contracting, then the IOL may get decentered. De this is another case in which presented with uh, a blunt trauma. And uh, what you see is a fibrosed anterior capsule and a small pupil which was stretched manually. So, stretching of the pu pupil can be either uh, in these cases, especially when there is a posterior synechia and um, uh, irregular pupil, hooks work better than uh, the um, malugin ring or any other device. So a small opening was made in the anterior capsule after which the first the cortical matter was removed and now you have, a, you have to may trim the rexus margin. So most important what you have seen in uh, the most of these videos is that we have to be very familiar with the use of cutter and especially those of us who are operating pediatric cataract they should be very very comfortable with uh, the cutter in uh, because there are various scenarios in which it has to be used and in this case even the posterior capsule is fibrous so once you are cutting then you see how the visual uh, axis gets uh, cleaned up and a slightly larger posterior capsule excess is made and this is the final outcome. Next comes what Sir had shown, posterior lenticonus. This is a variant of posterior lenticonus. As you can see through the total cataract, the posterior capsule is deficient and you can see the thick margins of the posterior capsule. So most important, don't do any hydro procedure in these cases when you are suspecting a pre-existing PC defect. And once this cortical aspiration has been done, and this is an error, you should not have come out of the eye suddenly. It should have been, the viscoelastic should have been pushed, and then I should have come out. And due to that, the once you are trying to dial the lens, it doesn't go in the bag because of the vitreous in the uh, bag. So vitrectomy was done. And then after that, once you dial the lens and it goes comfortably in the bag. So this is one of the error we should avoid when th there is a pre-existing PC defect. Don't decompress the eye suddenly. This is traumatic lens subluxation. Again, good part of, of, about these subluxations are that these are not progressive. So if you are able to achieve with just a CTR, it may stay, stay there without progressing further. And if not, if the lens is with the CTR is still decentered, then we can we should uh, apply a scleral fixation device. So, and another what you see in this here, vitreous is coming from the uh, loose portion. So dictum is once you have vitreous in the anterior chamber, first deal with the vitreous and then go back to cortical aspiration. Because if you are doing cortical aspiration with the vitreous in the anterior chamber, then that will cause vitreous traction and some retinal complications are possible. After the cortical aspiration, CTR is imp uh, implanted in the bag and it can be done either with the main port or side port, whatever you are comfortable with. And after that, uh, the CTR implantation, what we see is that uh, the bag is fairly well centered. Let us see after the IOL implantation. And even the haptic in that area helps in uh, centering the IOL. The vitreous is cleared from the zonular weakness side. Main port is sutured. And this is the final outcome of the case.
सो थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी thank you dr love for the excellent uh, videos you have, you have shown uh, these five rows capsule which is very common in these and many of these children uh, irrespective of the age they may need uh, primary prostate capsulotomy yeah. as you have done yes and i think centration of iol is uh, extremely important and many of the times it may need three piece iol but uh, you can many time you can put uh, single a single piece, piece also yeah. mm. so it was excellent presentation thank you thank you sir uh, B scan definitely if it is uh, if you are not able to visualize UBM we I we should do when we are suspecting as, uh, suppose uh, a pre-existing PC defect or anything but uh, it depends whether you have a facility in your center or not in my case I don't do UBM routinely. If you are suspecting a PC defect. Otherwise, also pediatric cataract, you don't need hydro. Actually, you don't need hydro. Mm. Any other question or comment? Uh? See, if you are uh, for capsule, I use uh, around uh, 1500, 1200 to 1500 cut rate and uh, vacuum of uh, 200 to 300. But we, when you are doing vitrectomy, it has to be the highest cut rate for that machine and uh, uh, vacuum of maybe 200. Mm. Yeah, that is what I showed in many of the cases. No? Uh, what do you think is the better way to do uh, It again depends on surgery. See, manual is very firm excess. Nothing can replace a manual uh, anterior capsule excess. But if you are, if you have a 23 or 25 gauge cutter and uh, high with uh, in those in normal capsule, you can even go for a higher cut rate. You get a very smooth round edge. If if surgeons are comfortable with that, not, no harm in doing that. Hmm. Thank you. I think uh, we'll close this session uh, now. And uh, of course, Love is here. He's going to be the moderator of the next session. So Love can continue. We'll just invite the speakers up on the dais for a photo, quick photograph uh, so that uh, we have that for record. And thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for being a part of this pediatric ophthalmology session.